the video that I want to do today is a direct follow-up of the one I did a few weeks ago, which Sean somewhat misguidedly entitled the most difficult program to compute question mark. It was, of course, all about the Ackerman function. Today, I want to show to you the Busy Beaver problem, or the Busy Beaver game. And it is far worse than Ackerman. It was invented by a gentleman called Tibor Rado in 1962. What he, in his later years, took on was to teach beginners about Turing machines. Now, many of you on the Sean and Brady wish list of topics to be covered said, I want to know about Turing machines, I want to know about undecidability. So this is a lovely uh, way to pull it all in, because this thing, this programme, that behaves even worse than Ackerman, depends and is utterly related to the idea of a Turing machine. For those of you who want just a bit more detail about what's going on at the Turing machine level and exactly how Tibor Rado developed a particular form of Turing machine suitable for this game, then I'm going to refer you to this short introductory movie. So let's look at the particular formulation of a Turing machine that Tibor Rado formulated as a game which you can play with your computer program and in fact there's web pages devoted to this you can join in on the busy beaver community and see if you can find a beaver that's even busier than the ones currently known but be warned as you want to go up and up and up in size of this problem it goes up worse than super exponentially this is the single state turing machine for the busy beaver problem. What the heck is this busy beaver problem? Busy beaver asks, what is the maximum number of ones that get printed on your tape for your given Turing machine when it halts? Now I've got to add that to the end because as we'll discover there are some, there are lots of rogue Turing machines which will go berserk either printing endless ones or even overwriting them with endless zeros and going either to the right or to the left. So these well behaved ones, we want them to halt and stop and just leave a big big tape with lots of ones and zeros on it. And it's called Busy Beaver because this program is just going bananas walking up and down the tape writing ones and zeros seemingly arbitrarily but in accordance with the program instructions on the cards and you're just saying how many ones do I end up with what's the best or worst I can do well I think this will become a bit more alive to you now if we take a real actual example of a single card during machine for a busy beaver so we stick our read write head in the middle of this tape to start off with there it is and this is card one it is the only card available to us because this is a one card turing machine rule is your start card is always card one the first thing you say is read a symbol so you read a zero okay what does the instruction card tell me to do it says overwrite it with a one that's the overwritten one zero remember means move to the left that makes zero so you move the head to here one that means go back to instruction card one i'm already in instruction one so what i do is go back in there like that but now again you say read what's under the head well the head's moved to here but you're under another zero now so you say okay overwrite that zero with a one shift to the left because that's what the zero means oh let me move the head here go back to state one we're already in state one, go back and do it again. You can see straight away what's going to happen here. I'm going to whiz off to the left writing ones and it will never, never stop. So here's the first example then of what I referred to in the previous video. I told you there were things called recursively enumerable programs that sometimes stopped and sometimes just whizzed into loops and went on forever. Well, here's a nice, simple example of it. Given that right at the start, you probably don't know whether your given program is going to whiz it left or right or whether it's just going to mess about in the middle. Start it in the middle, give it enough space to go left, enough space to go right. But the rules say in principle, if it needs infinite tape, give it enough. Now, a lot of the art of this kind of programming is to say, ah, but is it looping? 
it's pointless giving it infinite tape if it's just going to loop and loop and loop and not do any different thing forever. And yeah, very, very clearly this one's looping. So we've done a one card Turing machine, busy beaver attempt here and just seeing how easy it is to get into a loop and spin off doing zillions of ones that will never end. And you might say, oh, that's the idea then. Is it a sort of infinite busy beaver? It just spews out ones forever. And unfortunately, the rules of the game say, no, that doesn't count. It's got to halt. There's got to be a finite number of ones that you can count. Ones that just go on forever don't count. So you need to get into a halt state somehow or another. And... Uh, have a finite number of ones to count up. So let's do one that is still a single card candidate for a busy beaver Turing machine, but one that doesn't loop indefinitely. This time I'm going to make it be zero. If I read a zero, then I my actions are one, one, zero. Actually, some of you will have spotted already that in a one card setup like this, given that you move the head off to the left or the right, all you ever encounter is zeros, you are not going to get into a state of ever reading a one. Because you've, you've only got one instruction and you either keep re-obeying it, as we saw last time when you loop back into itself, or it's a one-off thing and it does one thing and stops. And in this particular case, well, I'll put one, one, zero here. For the one case, we won't need that, because look what happens. If I've read a zero, which I have there, what do I then do? The answer is I overwrite it with a one. The next one to the right of that in the instruction layout says shift right. Remember, a zero at that position is shift left. This one is shift right. So I shift the read right head to the right. But then C0 is the halt state. Wow bound to win an award. It reads a zero, it overwrites it with a one, it shifts one place to the right and then stops. Wonderful extremes, isn't it? It either whizzes off and never stops writing ones or else it does precisely one one and then stops and says, done it. And let's just do a bit of mental arithmetic here. It's not too difficult in this case. You've got a zero or a one as the things you might be reading, but here you've got a triple of binary digits. It's either naught or one that you read, it's either naught or one that you shift left or right, and it's either the halt state or back into one, which is where you go, right? So, Sean, you start off at 10. Two to the power three is eight. You've got that in the zero case, and in general, you've also got to say, well, I've got eight possibilities for the one case. So eight times eight is 64. There are 64 one card Turing machines. But there's only about four possible behaviours. You either zoom off to the left, printing and overwriting the cells with either ones or with zeros, or you can write a one, shift to the left and stop, one, shift to the right and stop, or overwrite a zero with a zero, shift to the left and stop, or shift to the right and stop. Not exactly thrilling, but since the aim of the Busy Beaver game is how many ones can you write, regardless of which of the 64 cards you choose, and you must try them all out, the answer is you never get better than one. You write one, one. Rado in his paper calls the score sigma, Greek sigma. The score for a one card busy beaver, the best you can do is one. Remember, these Turing machines are just made up of sets of cards in order, that's all. So for the order two, you're going to have a C1 and a C2. If you're having a C2 possibility, a two card thing, then that final column could be naught to halt it, one to go back into yourself, or two to go to the other card. So you've got three possibilities in that final column now. So it's not like two times two times two, it's two times two times three. Anyway, you work it all out. For the two card case, would you believe there are 20,736 Turing machines. So how many? 20,736. This number, which is just how many Turing machines have you got to look at to see which behaves the best in printing out lots of ones, this only goes up exponentially. This number, this isn't bad, but each one of those machines can behave worse than super exponentially. So Rado's number for how many Turing machines, you can see it in his paper. I'll leave you to work out for yourself why this is true. The number of Turing machines, let's call it N of N, 
is 4 times n plus 1, all raised to the power of 2n. Let's see if that works. If I put in 1 here for n, right, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 fours are 8, 8 to the power of 2 times 1, 2 times 1 is 2, 8 squared, 64, right? What about if I put in n is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 times 4 is 12, 12 to the power of 4. 12 to the power of 4 is 20,736. So your first job is to enumerate all those Turing machines. Just get all those possible two-card combinations that make 20,736 different possibilities. And you can start to weed out the rubbish straight away. You can clearly say, first of all, if your chosen machine doesn't have a halt state somewhere in it, then it's never ever going to stop and it can't be a contender. So you can rule out all the ones that don't have a zero somewhere in a right hand column. You can soon get rid of those, that'll cut it down a little bit. But then you have to start running the Turing machines to see, like I've done here, do they halt? If they halt, how many ones have they written by the time they've halted? It tends to be the case that all the ones that get written pretty well bunch together. But the rules of the game saying that's not absolutely essential. Just start at the far left with the earliest one, read across to the right and count up the number of ones you've got, and that's your score. But it must halt. It mustn't be in part of a I'm going on forever sort of loop. There are some candidates for best busy beaver of the two card Turing machine. What's the maximum number of ones that they can print out? Four. Not very good. And you think, what's all the fuss about? When you get on to three card Turing machines, how many of these are there on your shortlist? 16,777,216. Three card Turing machines. What's the best score you can get off a three card machine? Still only six. Doesn't look very ominous or dreadful at this stage. Four card ones. How many of those are there? Now, I've gone up to about four card ones in the program I'll give you. The answer is 25.6 trillion possible Turing machines, all of which have to be run and their behavior investigated or they have to be eliminated. These are four card machines. What's the best score you can get off those? 13. And this goes worse than Ackerman. Yeah, this is the false dawn. It just goes berserk now. When you come on to five card Busy Beavers, which is where there's huge research still going on, the best score so far off a five card Turing machine, and I've not worked out how many of those there are, it's gonna be huge. All of which have to be investigated the best score for a five card so far is 4,098. It's coming up to 25 years ago that that number was discovered. 4,098 is the best yet. So I hear you say, what are they messing about at? They've had 25 years and all right, there's a few trillion, quadrillion Turing machines to be investigated, but all the obvious rubbish will have been weeded out by now. I may say that the uh, German uh, researchers who discovered this number did have access to a supercomputer. It does help. What's gone wrong? Why isn't there a better result? And if you look on the Wikipedia page for this, you'll find the answer. The answer is that there are 40 candidates still running which might produce an even better answer than 4098. And you'll say, but surely the darn things are either discernibly looping or else they've stopped. No, it's really horrible. This is a nasty part of it. You can get Turing machines where you can't tell whether they're looping or not. They consume a lot of tape and then they come back and they overwrite bits of the tape and, you know, and you think, have I seen that pattern before? In the case that I did, for the one state Turing machine, when it's going one, 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 over, it takes no genius to say it's looping and it's doing nothing but producing ones. But you can imagine that as the numbers go up, you could get very, very long cyclic periodicity with a periodicity of 20 million or something like this. Tibor Rado and his student were the people who worked out that 
for a four car machine, 13 was the best result you could get. But in getting that result, they still had to look at a handful of rogue machines. They weren't sure whether they stopped or not. Some of them they could prove programmatically were definitely looping. Others, they could use human inference to argue, yes, that is looping and I can show you why. So yeah, 13 is definitely correct. But for the five case, who knows? Join the Busy Beaver Club, get your own supercomputer, do the work. And somebody out there has gone on to order six. And it is reckoned that the minimum possible score for an order six Busy Beaver will be of the order 10 to the power of 10,500. Now that's getting very close in size to Ackerman 4.2, you know, at two to the power of 60 something thousand. Nobody knows what the right score is. So can you see that already by order five or six, you're getting into Ackerman size numbers. And one of the things shown on the Wikipedia page, which will delight you, is that for all sufficient N, and N is not very big, Busy Beaver numbers will always outrank Ackerman numbers. And the reason for that is that, again, in the literature, which you can look up for yourself, the reason is that the busy beaver can be shown to grow faster than any computable function. It doesn't matter what you put in there, but if it's a computable function that has an answer, busy beaver can be shown to grow faster than that. In the long run, it may not do for, for small n, but eventually it'll overtake it and go completely mad. So yes, the answer to the horrible question is, are you telling me this thing gives you even bigger numbers than Ackerman does? Yes, it does. Effortlessly bigger. Some people say, I don't believe all this stuff about recursively innumerable. Sometimes it can, you know, sometimes this machine can stop and give you an answer and sometimes it just whizzes around forever. Well, here you've got it in front of you. Um, and it really, it is not, terrifically useful except it's here as a teaching example of saying it may seem pointless but this is the worst that can happen with a computer program you set on the face of it what seems to be a perfectly straightforward thing run this Turing machine hope it holds and then tell me how many ones it prints out but behind that is a huge amount of illustration of theory you think, oh, that's going to be no worse than super exponential, even when it explodes and takes off. This one rockets up far faster than Ackerman. And very often you will say, if problems are badly behaved, they are either super exponential, or they may be even worse, they may actually be undecidable. And this is what you are saying in this thing here.